Hi everyone, in this video we're going to get to see some of the calculus, in particular integration techniques, that we've been learning in action. Uh, in particular, in this video, we'll get to see how integration can be used in several different contexts to solve certain types of applied problems. And in particular, the two applications we're going to be looking at uh, in this case come from uh, economics or the social sciences and the biological sciences. So uh, for our first application, I want to talk about something called uh, the Gini index or the Gini coefficient. So in economics and the social sciences, there's a need at times to be able to measure and quantify the distribution of different resources, in particular, uh, to try and quantify whether or not there is inequality in that distribution of resources, whether those resources uh, are, are money resources, whether they're physical resources uh, like access to food or water, um, lots of things. And we'll see actually some particular uses of this Gini index towards the end of this, uh, this section. Um, but one way to start thinking about this is something called the Lorenz curve, um, which is a graphical representation of the distribution of a resource in a population. And the Gini coefficient then is a way, uh, is a number that we use to measure uh, the inequality that we can see in a Lorenz curve. So uh, let's actually take a look at one of these. Uh, so over here, I have uh, uh, an illustration of a Lorenz curve. So uh, the sort of arc uh, over here is the Lorenz curve. You can see that labeled. Uh, and then you also see a line at a 45 degree angle. Um, and that line uh, gives us sort of, it's called the line of equality. And it really sort of gives us an illustration of what would happen if resources, resources were uh, equally distributed throughout the population. So what you're looking at uh, on the x-axis, you have the cumulative share of people uh, from, from lowest to highest amount of resources. Um, and so sort of what you're seeing is uh, if you're looking, say, to the far left of this graph, then you're looking at, say, uh, the bottom, you know, let's say you're, you're sort of down over here. Um, you're looking at the, say, bottom 5%. And then you're going up to see sort of what percentage of the resources do the bottom 5% have. Now, if things were uh, equally distributed, then the bottom 5% would have 5% of the resources, and the bottom 50% would have 50% of the resources. But as we know, with many things, that's not exactly true. So you end up with this Lorenz curve, which, for example, shows you here that like the bottom 5% may only have 2% uh, of the income, right? Now, it's impossible for the bottom 5% to have more than 5% of the income. Otherwise, they wouldn't be the bottom 5%. Um, so everything is always below, the Lorenz curve always lies below or on this line of equality. Um, it can never go above. Uh, you can actually show more about this, um, this line. It has to be, uh, for example, convex. Um, you can show some other properties. Uh, but generally, this is what the Lorenz curve is. So uh, if we call that uh, Lorenz curve uh, L of X, then we'd like to be able to measure the Gini coefficient, which is just going to be the ratio of the area A to the total area there, which is A plus B. So if I uh, switch back momentarily here to make this a little larger, so you see A is the area of that uh, sort of upper crescent and B is the area uh, below that crescent in the triangle. So in particular, A plus B is the total area of that triangle. Okay. So the Gini coefficient essentially is just measuring the ratio of A, the area above the Lorenz curve, to uh, the total area here. Okay. So uh, in particular, when A is large, right, when, when that area A is large, that means there's a lot of inequality, because in particular, that means that uh, this Lorenz curve is sort of shifted over, uh, and so there's there's a lot of wealth concentrated towards the very top uh, percentage of resource holders. Um, on the other hand, if it's low, that means that our, our curve is sort of pushed out towards that line of equality. And so when Gini coefficients are low, the, the distribution of resources is fairly equal. When the Gini coefficient gets large, larger, uh, that means we're seeing more inequality. Now, uh, we can actually express this Gini coefficient. So uh, if we, we think about this, um, a, that area A, is just the difference between that line of equality 
which is just, uh, sorry, it's the area between that line of equality and the Lorentz curve. Okay. And so uh, that's just the integral. Uh, if we think of those percentages on the x-axis, right, that's cumulative uh, share of the population that goes from zero to 100%. If we uh, express those as numbers, that's zero to one. And so the area A can be expressed like this. Now, the area A plus B is just the total area of that triangle. And that triangle, the base is a percentage going from zero to 100, so zero to one. And then again, zero to one on the, the y-axis, uh, because that is, again, a percentage of the total resources. And so the area of this triangle would just be one half, one times one, or one half. And so uh, this ratio, the Gini coefficient, just becomes this integral divided by one half. And of course, dividing by one half is the same as multiplying by two. And so we get a really nice expression then for the Gini coefficient, which is that it's just two times the integral from zero to one of x minus the Lorentz curve of x dx. Okay. Uh, to make this a little more concrete, uh, let's maybe work our way through a particular example to see how this is calculated. So imagine our population consists of five people and collectively the total resources of this group is, is $100. So uh, if we look at this, and I've ordered these from sort of person one has the least amount of money, person five has the most amount of money, so um, sort of by increasing wealth. Um, and so if I wanted to create my Lorenz curve here, um, the first thing I would do, because I have five total people, I would look at person one, and I would say, well, that person represents the bottom 20% of the population. And the bottom 20% of the population has five of the $100. So just looking at this person, right, I could come over here and say, okay, uh, L of 0.2. So L of 0.2 should tell me what the bottom 20% of the population, what percentage of the total wealth do they have? Well, they have five of the $100, so they have 5%. Now, if I look at the bottom two people, the bottom two people, so person one and two, right, they represent uh, the bottom 40%. So I could ask how much money, or what, sorry, what percentage of uh, the total wealth does the bottom 40% have? Well, they have collectively $15, which represents... 15% of the total wealth. Okay. I can again continue in this fashion. So now I'm going to look at the top three, or sorry, the bottom three. Oops, a little far there. Okay. So if I look at the bottom three people, the bottom three people represent the bottom 60%. Collectively, the bottom 60% have, let's see, what's that, $30. So they have 30% of the total wealth. Run out of colors here. Uh, if I look at person, persons one through four, they represent the bottom 80%. And collectively, they have $50, so they have 50% of the total resources. And then always L of one, well, everyone, this is the bottom 100%, which is everyone has all of the resources. Now, again, I could add this up and see collectively 100% of the people have 100 of the $100. So that gets me that, um, but always L of one is one and L of zero is zero. So uh, now that we have this, we can actually use these points to plot the Lorentz curve. And what I'm going to do is in between, I'm just going to sort of extrapolate by, by drawing a line. Okay. So if I do that, 
Okay, and here my values have, have gotten cut off slightly by the image overlaying here. But so you can see here, uh, this sort of red line is that line of equality. And the green line, uh, the green curve is the curve I get by plotting these points, right? So applying the point, point 0.2 comma 0 0.05, point 0.4 comma 0.15, so on and so on. And just linearly uh, extrapolating between those points, okay? Now, if I then want to calculate the Gini coefficient, the question then becomes, what is that area between the line of perfect equality and my Laurent's curve in green? Okay. Right. So in order to calculate the Gini coefficient, all I need to do is calculate that area and then multiply it by two to get my Gini coefficient. And uh, it's, a, it's not a difficult calculation to do. You can find the area of that region is 0.2, and therefore the Gini coefficient is 0.4. Now, without any sort of uh, context, it can be difficult to really interpret whether that's a good or a bad Gini coefficient, right? Um, there's no sort of like absolute, this is a good Gini coefficient, and this is a bad Gini coefficient. Um, so it's sort of, I can't tell you whether, you know, this doesn't make some claim that this is a good or a bad uh, distribution of wealth, say, within that group. Um, but what it is really helpful for is comparing um, sort of two distributions. So uh, in particular, just to, for you to see uh, a couple of other applications of this Gini coefficient, uh, this chart here uh, actually measures uh, income. It gives actually the Gini index for a number of different countries, you can sort of see them labeled over here, um, for a number of different countries uh, since World War II. So that you see the Gini index varying by year. Um, and so you can see, you know, some countries uh, Gini index has declined significantly over time. So uh, what would that suggest? That would suggest that the income inequality is decreasing, right? The Gini index going down means things are getting more equal. Um, uh, other ones you see going up, right? And then you can also look at them relative to one another, right, to determine whether maybe one country has more income inequality than another. So again, these Gini, uh, this Gini index or this Gini coefficient, um, as sort of on its own, it doesn't necessarily uh, may maybe have a lot of meaning. But if we look at it in the context of, say, either over time or as a comparison, it can be a helpful tool uh, in, in understanding these sorts of things. Um, so certainly you can do it with income, um, but you can do it with other things. So, for example, uh, this is from a paper um, where they were thinking about uh, electricity as a, a, or electrical consumption as a, a resource. Right. And so looking at sort of different countries and calculating a Gini index, so sort of a, an, an inequality in terms of uh, electrical consumption. Uh, again, you can use that in context to help you sort of understand um, which of these countries, um, you know, maybe which of these countries have more or less um, equal electrical consumption across their population. Um, so you see, for example, the U.S., uh, and this, this study is a bit old now, but uh, the U.S. had a Gini index of 0.37, um, which as compared to these other countries uh, here was really not that bad. Um, but, you know, it just gives you again, and it's hard to say on its own whether 0.37 is good or bad, but we can use it to compare to other countries. Uh, finally, just I found this one humorous. Um, there have been folks who have used Gini, the Gini index to measure the quote unquote tender economy um, and looking at how uh, sort of um, matches in different uh, on different dating apps are distributed across the total number of users. Um, so I don't I don't know a whole thing about uh, this particular study, um, but it, it is just another interesting application of the Gini index and really, I think, sort of highlights uh, the wide number of, of ways you can think about measuring uh, uh, inequality of different resources. Now, moving on to another application, uh, I now want to talk a bit about uh, seed dispersal. So I'm, I'm thinking now I'm moving uh, over to the biological sciences, sort of ecology, and thinking about the different ways that plants may spread uh, their seeds, right? 
So um, there are a lot of different ways. Wind dispersal, um, if you think about, you know, as a kid, you might have picked dandelions and you can blow the, the, the sort of uh, petals off the dandelion. Um, but actually, each of those little white uh, puffs is connected to a seed at the bottom. Uh, and they really aren't made for you to blow, although that's fine. Um, they're really meant for the wind to come. They blow and they carry the seeds away so that the dandelions spread. Um, other plants use water dispersal. So, for example, water lilies, uh, animal dispersal. Um, I'll actually show you a picture of that in a minute to explain that. Um, and then there are even things, uh, there are these peas that... Um, they sort of grow and then they sort of actually pop open and explode and shoot the seeds out um, in order to help sort of, again, spread the plants, um, right? There's sort of that evolutionary advantage, right? You, you, you need to reproduce, um, the plants need to reproduce. And so the question is, how are they gonna spread their seeds in order to do that? Um, it's sort of important uh, for many types of plants Right, that they not drop their seeds right where they are because then those plant, those new plants will be competing with them for resources. So again, um, a big question is sort of, well, how far are these seeds getting dispersed? Um, so again, just to give you a couple of ideas. So uh, you see up here, um, that's just you know your usual dandelion. And again, you can sort of see on the end of that, the, there's a, the white puff and then the stem at the bottom and then there's a seed there. So again, the, the wind is going to carry it potentially far away, which is good. Um, that will help the dandelion spread and they won't be isolated to one location where they'll be in competition with each other. Um, you also get, I mentioned animal dispersal. So uh, you can see here, um, these are the seeds of some plant that... Um, and you might have seen these these sort of things before that they they almost have this like these velcro like hooks that will uh they'll often latch into like your clothing um but they're really meant to latch into like the fur of an animal or something passing by um they'll get stuck on the animal the animal will will wander away and then eventually they'll fall off the animal somewhere else um so this is another uh, really really good efficient method of of seed dispersal that some plants take advantage of um, now, uh, we can sort of make a couple of, of assumptions about seed dispersal, um, and these are actually important for folks who do modeling in this area. So the first is that um, most, not all, but most seed dispersal we sort of assume to be uh, random. So if you think about... Um, if you think about the dandelion, right, it's going to get sort of thrown up in the air and the wind might blow it around all over the place. And it's going to it's going to land somewhere. But if we assume random movement, it's sort of equally as likely to go north as it is to go south, as it is to go east, as it is to go west. And it could go some of each. And so sort of on average, we expect that the seeds don't end up that far away. When I say on average, right, I mean, the probability of it going four miles east is the same as it going four miles west. Uh, and so on average, right, you've sort of netted zero, right, in terms of movement. So on average, uh, things are staying sort of fairly close to where they started. Um, the other is that long distance dispersal is, is usually pretty unlikely, um, right? And again, this follows from that sort of random movement. Um, if I'm equally as, equally as likely to go east as west, um, then, then sort of on average, I don't expect to go too far. Um, of course, there are exceptions to all of these things, um, but these are some basic assumptions we can make. Um, so I actually pulled some data. So this was from a study um, where they actually measured a couple of different kinds of seeds and then measured how far they dispersed uh, from the original plant. So uh, you see along the X axis here is the distance from the plant. And uh, if you look up on the Y axis, that's the, the number of seeds uh, of that species that were at that distance. So again, you sort of see that most of the seeds didn't go very far from the plant, right? So near the origin, we see sort of relatively high numbers of seeds. As we get more than say, you know, six, eight, 10 meters away, there are very, very few seeds that get even 10 meters away from the plant, okay? Um, so if, if I sort of look at these, and you can actually see in this paper, they, they sort of, uh, they measured these data points. So you can see the data points, um, but then they also fit some curves to them. Um, and if we sort of look at those curves, um, these functions sort of, the, the red curve, if you look at it, sort of looks like a, maybe a decaying exponential curve. Uh, and if you look at the blue curve, it actually looks um, not quite like an exponential, because if you look carefully, it's sort of flat at first and then falling down, it sort of looks like 
Um, if you've taken a statistics course, you might have seen the normal distribution or the bell curve. It's sort of sort of shaped like that. Um, so these these have sort of familiar shapes. Um, and actually, um, we have uh, the data for these curves, right? So we have um, what those curves, those red and the blue curves are. So the red curve here is this uh, exponential curve. So uh, roughly what that's telling us is N is the number of seeds, X is the distance from the plant. And so uh, the number of seeds N of X uh, that we find at distance X is modeled by 450 times E to the minus six X. Makes sense we would have exponential to a negative, with a negative growth rate there, right? A negative power is gonna be decreasing as X gets large. Uh, the blue curve, uh, similar, but again, it's more of a bell type curve or a normal distribution. So you actually get uh, uh, e to the minus some constant times x squared. Uh, in this case, they, they fit it to the data so that the coefficient they got out front was 350. And this constant you got he get here is negative 0 0.08. Okay. So um, this is the kind of data that, that ecologists uh, can gather experimentally, right? You, you have some plants or you go out and find these plants. You, you do these sorts of measurements. Um, these are, are very standard sort of ecological experiments. But then once we have the data, right, we're going to fit a curve to them. And now we can start to ask questions, right, based on this information. Uh, in particular, once I have these curves, which give me the number of seeds at distance x, the first thing I could ask is sort of, well, could I develop a, a probability function that would sort of give me some information about a likelihood uh, that a seed travels, you know, out some certain distance, right? Um, so if I think uh, in general about probabilities, right, um, one of the key sort of features of, of probabilities, right, is that um, everything should add up to one, right? If I sort of have the probability of it going one meter and two meters and three meters, and four, but add all those probabilities together, I ought to get one, okay? So in order to get this probability function, okay, what I want to do is I want to take my N of X function, but I want to scale it by sort of the sum of all the seeds, right? And the way I'm going to do that Right? If I think again, it's sort of the integral as being a way of adding up all of the n of x, I'm just going to integrate that from zero to infinity. Okay? So if I'm back in that sort of example of the red curve, right? there I had n of x was equal to 450 e to the minus 6x, then I can actually calculate this integral. Right? This is an improper integral. Okay? So if I want the integral from zero to infinity, of n of x dx. Well, it's improper, so I'm going to rewrite this. The limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from 0 to b of 450 e to the minus 6x dx. Okay, And now, well, I need to come off to the side here, I guess, and, and calculate this. So let's see. If I want this, uh, I'm first just going to need an antiderivative of this. So the antiderivative of 450e to the minus 6x dx is what? Well, uh, it would almost be 450e to the minus 6x, except I have this coefficient of minus 6, which I'll divide by here. And in fact, uh, I could simplify this, but we'll see in a minute, actually. I'm just going to leave it as minus 450 over 6 e to the minus 6x. Okay, that's my antiderivative. Okay, now I need to evaluate this. I'm going to take the limit as b goes to infinity. I need here the integral from 0 to b. So if I integrate this then from 0 to b, it'll just be this evaluated at b and 0 and take a difference. So evaluated at b, this is minus 450 over 6, e to the minus 6b minus a negative. And then I'll get e to the 0, but that's just 1. Okay, So I get that the integral from 0 to b is this. And now I need to take a limit as b goes to infinity 
of minus 450 over 6e to the minus 6b plus 450 over 6. And as b goes to infinity, this exponent goes to negative infinity. And e to a power that's going to the negative infinity, this term goes to 0. And so I get that this is just 450 over 6. So now, if for this problem I wanted to calculate my probability function, what would that be? That would be n of x divided by this integral which is 450 over 6. And now if I look at this, right, uh, the reason I left it written like this is it's really easy to see this ends you up with this. So now I'm able to derive for this function a probability function. For the this function n of x, I'm able to derive an associated probability function. Now, um, what we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about is that, but I, I want to mention is that you should not think of this function as telling you the probability that a seed is at distance x, right? Because if you look at this, this tells you that the probability a seed is at distance 0 is 6. And the probability, you know, that like you get things that are sort of nonsensical, right? The probability of something can't be 6. Um, the way to sort of interpret this is more in the sense of what we would think of as a distribution, a probability distribution. Um, so I don't want to exactly get into that, but in some ways this is giving you a probability. Um, you, you just have to be able to interpret it in the right way. So for example, if you wanted to know uh, the probability that a seed was within uh, distance 1, you could integrate from 0 to 1 p of x dx, and that would give you the probability in fact, that a seed is between 0 and 1. Okay, so again, it doesn't make sense to sort of think about it at individual points, but over intervals, this makes uh, more sense. All right. Now, we could do the same thing uh, for the other function. Okay. Uh, I'm not actually going to calculate it here, but I'll show you what you get when you do calculate it. Um, but it's just worth mentioning you, you could, in fact, uh, calculate that value. Uh, it's a bit harder, however, also because uh, you have to integrate that thing that's like e to the minus x squared. So um, that, that's a little difficult, but numerically you could do that. Okay. So uh, again, we've already seen we get the, the 6e to the minus 6x. Uh, for the uh, normal distributed curve, the, the blue curve, uh, you divide through and you end up with 0.6383 e to the minus 0 0.08 x squared. Okay, so again, all that changes is that coefficient out front because you're dividing by that integral in the denominator. All right, um, so great. So now this can help you sort of understand the probability that seeds travel, you know, certain in certain ranges. Um, but you might also wonder, well, sort of on average, how far does a seed travel? Okay, and so again, we can use integration to help us here. Um, so um, we can figure out the expected value of this variable or sort of the average value of that variable. Now, to, to make sense of this, um, you can sort of start by imagining, um, imagine I tell you that I roll, um, you know, I roll a 10-sided a, a die, right? Um, but it's, or actually, let's say it's a six-sided die. Okay, but um, it's not equally likely to land on each of the six faces. So maybe I tell you, um, you know, I, I've got this thing set up so that it never lands on one. So, so this is X. This is the probability that I roll X. Okay, so I, I have, this thing's rigged. It'll never land on one. Uh, half the time it lands on two. A quarter of the time it lands on three. Uh, it never lands on four. Uh, a quarter of the time it lands on five and it never lands on six. Okay. And so imagine I gave you this information and I said, well, I want you to find 
um, sort of the expected value, sort of the average value of a bunch of rolls. So say I'm going to roll it 50 times. I want you to sort of tell me what you think the, the average of those rolls will be. Well, the way you would do that is you'd say, well, it's never one. Half the time, it has the value two. So let me actually write these the other way around. And you would say half the time, uh, it has the value two. It's two half the time. It's three a quarter of the time. It's never four, right? And so I could, I could write zeros in for those if I want. So, so maybe I'll do that. So I get one zero percent of the time, two half the time, three a quarter of the time, never get four. I get five a quarter of the time. And I get six, again, none of the time. Okay. And so if I were to add all this up, let's see, I'd get one plus three fourths plus five fourths, give me eight fourths, which is two. Okay. And I would see that on average, I expect my average roll to be a three. All right. So what did I do? In this case, I added up X times P of X for all of my different X values, right? So this sigma just represents a sum. I summed up all my different X values times their probability. So I did one times zero, added to that two times a half, added to that three times a quarter, so on and so on and so on. Okay. Now, we can do the same thing with uh, these continuous probability distributions. So if I want the expected value of X, okay, that ought to be add up X times P of X for all your different X values, okay? So again, if we go back and look at, think about that first example, um, or sorry, not the, uh, the, the first curve, right, in the second application, right? So we found that probability function was six E to the minus six X dx. Okay. Now notice I can fix this uh, a bit. So I pull that factor that six out, I'll get x e to the minus six x dx. Okay. This is an improper integral. And you can compute this improper integral. So I'm actually going to pause the in, the the uh, video and I want you to go ahead and see if you can calculate uh, this value. Okay, great. So uh, if we're just looking at this integral, two things we should note, right? We should note that it is an improper integral, right? And the actual integrand itself looks like something that would probably work uh, using integration by parts. Um, so let's actually see what we can do here. So I first want the antiderivative of x e to the minus 6x. Okay. So if I do this by parts, my u is going to be x. u prime will be 1. That means v prime is e to the minus 6x. And so v is minus 1 sixth e to the minus 6x. Applying the integration by parts formula gives me that this is minus x over 6 e to the minus 6x. That's u times v. Minus the integral of u prime v. So that's going to end up being a plus one six integral e to the minus six x dx. I can now evaluate this directly. Okay, this will become a minus one over 36 e to the minus six x. But now I need to uh, calculate this improper integral. Okay. So if I calculate this improper integral, uh, I'm going to first need to calculate this from 0 to b. So I'm going to evaluate this at 0 and at b. If I plug in b here, I'll get minus b over 6, e to the minus 6b, plus minus 1 over 36, e to the minus 6b. And let's see, at zero, so that's at B, minus at zero, this term is zero, and at zero, this term is minus one over 36. 
So I'm just going to put so it's minus negative 1 over 36, so plus 1 over 36. Sorry, my sixes look a bit like Bs. Uh, so now, to calculate this improper integral, I need to take a limit as B goes to infinity. In here, just take a limit of this. Okay. And so let's see what happens. Well, as B goes to infinity, this term is going to go to zero. That's going to stay as 1 over 36. This term is a little bit tricky. You can do uh, L'Hopital's rule here, uh, the moral of the story. So what happens is you have this B, which is going to infinity, and this E to the minus 6B, which is going to zero. So you have something that's going off to infinity, something that's going to zero. The question is sort of which one is going to win, and the answer is the exponential function. Exponential functions grow or decay much more quickly than linear functions. So this term is also going to go to zero. So that's going to zero, that's going to zero, and we end up with 1 over 36. And so this value here is 6 times 1 over 36. And so the expected value of uh, sort of the expected uh, dispersal distance of that first seed uh, is, is 1 over 6, right? It's 1 sixth of a meter. Okay. Um, now, we can also, again, do the same thing for the other curve. Um, that's a, a nice little challenge because you can actually compute that integral. Uh, it ends up being a U substitution. It's actually a bit easier uh, to compute, um, but you can compute that. And so you can find the expected uh, dispersal distance of each of those seeds types of seeds, I should say, right? There are many seeds. On average, we're talking about how far we expect uh, the seeds to disperse, okay? So again, uh, for that red curve, we get the expected uh, value, of the, the expected dispersal distance is one sixth. Uh, if you compute this for the blue curve, uh, you should get an expected distribution distance, or an expected dispersal distance of 3.989. Um, important to note, right, these are, these are very different numbers, and, and they're different curves, so maybe that's not totally surprising. But I'll also point out that the shape of that distribution, whether it's exponential or normal, also plays a large role um, in, in affecting this expected value, because how they sort of decay at infinity turns out to, to really contribute quite a bit uh, to their overall behavior. Okay. Um, so with that, we'll conclude our two applications. I, I really just wanted you to see um, that all this stuff we've been doing about integration isn't just for mathematical interest, although certainly it's okay if you find it mathematically interesting, but it can be used in a wide variety of fields to quantify uh, everything from, say, income inequality to expected uh, dispersal distance of the seed. I also uh, want to say congratulations. Um, we're halfway through the course now. This is sort of the halfway point. And so I thought I'd give you a little bit of a break. We're not going to have homework or a quiz with this video. Um, you can use today as a chance to maybe get caught up on some things if you've gotten a bit behind. Um, you can uh, complete the, and, and also to complete the mid-session course evaluation, which will open up once you've watched this video.